I sneaked into Messi's dad's hotel for a meeting with him and I said, we want your son. But then obviously he'd had offers from Saudi, he'd had offers to go back to Barcelona. It was then down to him to decide. I remember Victoria being on tour with the Spice Girls without obviously telling anyone. I flew over to see Victoria one night. I'm on the way back to Manchester, just waiting to board and the gaffer walks in. Oh, on the same flight. That's unlucky, isn't it? it was, yeah, was it the other as well? <laughs> <laughs> You always used to call me the Flash Cockney. I'd right. rather be the Flash yeah. Cockney, would you? <laughs> I just felt at that point he would either want me in or you in. Quite surprising he got rid of me and not you. <laughs> Everybody goes on about Cantona, but this man here. You, oh, you're you, too kind. Oh, you, <laughs> he means you. his lad. <laughs> Welcome to the second episode of Stick to Football, brought to you by Skybet, and I'm delighted to welcome an old teammate of mine, David Beckham. And uh, yeah, you've been up to a lot recently. You've uh, obviously brought Messi to Miami. You're shooting a documentary film that's coming out next week. But just talk to us about Miami first, because I think bringing Messi to the club has captured the imagination of everyone in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to be honest, obviously, um, you know, when I started this journey ten years ago, um, announcing that I was starting a team in Miami. My vision was always to bring the best players. Now, I suppose as an owner of a team, you always want to bring the best players, but the chance of bringing the best players is difficult um, and always challenging. But then I sneaked into Messi's dad's hotel about four years ago in Barcelona for a meeting with him. Uh, and obviously at that point, you know, we wasn't ready to bring him and he wasn't ready to come. but. He, uh, I turned around to his dad and said, we want your son. We want him to come to Miami when he's ready. And if that's a possibility, we continued the conversations and with my partners, Jorge Mas uh, and Jose. And uh, we just worked on it for four, about four years. And then when he was at PSG, we then saw an opportunity that he was either going to go back to Barcelona, um, but then all of a sudden everything aligned. And then we were still having the conversations. And, uh, but to bring someone like him to, to the club, we knew it would change the club and we knew it would change the league and the sport. But it's beyond that. You know, it's beyond that. What he does on the pitch, what he does off the pitch, you know, for the young kids, you know, to bring someone like him is the dream. And also Jordi Alba and, and Busquets, uh, Sergio. But to bring Leo, he's changed everything. You know, the academy kids now have got someone else to look up to that has done everything, won everything, and he's teaching them, which is which is amazing. You know, the other day it was a it was a funny um, interview from one of the academy kids who's doing really well, and they turned around to him and said, you know, what's the best bit of advice Leo's given you so far? And he said to walk more. <laughs> he was like, he told me to walk more in the game. He said, because you see more. So, you know, it's, it's, it's already started. So it's already started with the, the good that he does. It's, uh, it's incredible. You know, we've seen what he's done, bringing so much joy. He looks amazing every, every single game. When, when was the moment and what was it like, the moment when he said, yep, I'm there, I'm coming? I think it was actually more emotional than it should have been just because for the last 10 years to try and get this team up and running in Miami, there's been so many obstacles, so many challenges and sometimes it looked like it weren't going to happen and then obviously everything came together once I found the right partners um, in Miami. But the moment I was actually in Japan, the, 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 the morning that I found out that he was coming, um, his dad had called us that week and said Leo's going to make an announcement. Um, and then obviously two days out, they was like, okay, in the next two or three days, he's going to come out and say something. So we were kind of just waiting. And I was in Japan working. And it was five o'clock in the morning. The kids are in bed. Victoria's still sleeping. And my phone is like going mad because I would forgot to turn it on silent. So Victoria's like telling me to turn it off. So I pick it up and I saw a barrage of like messages. Mm. And it was just he'd come out and done his interview. But we always obviously wanted him to make a decision based on, you know, he wanted to live there with his family, wanted to still win and play, play football in the way he plays it. But we wanted him to announce it in, in his way. And he literally was sat in a hotel room with his mate filming and saying that he's coming to Miami. So for us, it was like, it was an unbelievable, I was very emotional about it because it, it's taken a long time. A, long, a lot of like, hard work to get here. So the contracts were agreed months before, obviously, and he was just deciding... Yeah. No, well, we'd, we'd kind of 
He hadn't tapped him up. He hadn't tapped him up. I'm trying to think about it. He hadn't tapped him up. 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 And the Barcelona one kind of really worried me because obviously it pulls on the heartstrings yeah. for him. He never really got to say a really a proper goodbye at Barcelona. So that was the one that really worried me. Um, but then, you know, it was then down to him to decide. And so was... I think most of us here think he's you know, one of the best players we've ever seen, maybe the best. I mean, has he gone up in your estimation, you know, watching him in the flesh, seeing him day in, day out? I mean, I played against him, obviously, for PSG and I played against him for Real Madrid at Barcelona. And you could, obviously, he was unbelievable then. But it's not until you physically see him and you sat there and you're watching him and every move that he does and every, every he never gives the ball away. Mm. Um, he's unbelievable for the young kids. He's great with the young kids. And, and watching Leo in training, you know, when he first joined, and um, when he arrived in Miami and he was training, I was there for the first five weeks when he first arrived. And I was in the training ground 7 a.m. every morning just to, just to watch him. And I'm 48 years old. So, I, you know, to, to just watch him do what he does, train the way he does, prepare the way, it's just, it re it's just different. What makes him like so special? Like what's that one thing when you're watching him and you're like, why is he the best player? Do you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, we, were, we all grew up in an era of like, um, you know, you have to run and yeah. chase and, yeah. and, and, and then you watch him. That's still okay with Bex. He's just have to run. <laughs> I made a career on that. Find a club, yeah. But he's clever. He's yeah. he's so cl like he's his brain works in different ways. You know, he sees things that other players just don't see for five minutes after that, and it's mm. just it's just amazing to watch. So everything, literally everything, he never gives. Like I said, never gives the ball away. His work ethic is still there. You know, he won the World Cup last year, and he still is as hungry as he was when he was a young kid. So. It's, it's amazing. Your journey to Cy and Messi was a little bit like mine to get Roy to come to the stick to the stick to the football. <laughs> <laughs> it took about four years. <laughs> but just, just, just on just a final question on Messi. Um, what is he like as a person? Obviously, I've seen pictures of you out with him, sort of like. Mm. Does he, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking simple things like, does he have a glass of wine? Does he have a you know a beer or something? Does he do normal things? Yeah, there? he's a he's, he's a great he's, lad, is he? <laughs> <laughs> oh, great lad. <laughs> First in, last out. To be fair, he is. Yeah. He is. But apart from that, he is. He's so humble. He is really humble. You know, it's just the, the normal things that we all think that's that's how it should be. Mm. You know, he. You know, this is this is someone that you know, especially in Miami, he's not left alone. You know, he's he's chased everywhere. He's followed everywhere. There's thousands of people every single day at the training ground just to watch him get in his car and leave and drive down the road. And and but from the moment he landed in Miami, he drives himself to the supermarket, does his shopping, goes home, and people are shocked at that. But that is him. He's humble. He's hardworking. He's got a great family. His wife's amazing. The kids are amazing. He's just a normal guy with an unbelievable talent. How do you construct a deal as an owner for a player like that to come to your club? How do you even think to start? I mean, the co I, I'm just thinking at like Salford level where you're trying to get a player in on a couple of grand a week, but to, how do you bring that together? It's just, there was a lot of moving parts, obviously. A lot of people had to um, help us with it. You know, obviously when I moved to LA, you know, there was different contracts put in. You know, I was obviously allowed to buy a team you know, at that point, which I don't think they'll ever do again. Then obviously Apple were involved and Adidas were involved. So he's got different contracts. So it's... You know. <laughs> Did he get a club car? Did he get a club car? <laughs> <laughs> he's he's a club club car. Car. Yeah. He Lionel Messi, yeah. Miami, into Miami. I think I got a Tesco club car. <laughs> That's why people are following him. He's anyway, got his name on his car. You've got a massive week coming up. You've got the premiere of your film, which mm. is, is going unbelievably well. And I, I, I'm there. <laughs> right is there. Don't you don't do premieres, Roy? When is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's oh, the third. I, yeah. Uh, mm. I didn't want to take Keenan the attention away from you. I didn't want to take the it. attention away from you. He's always invited, Keenan. Yeah. <laughs> but Apart from dinner in Qatar. <laughs> Yeah. I invited you. Yeah. It was him who uh, made the right, decision. That's, that's the I told I don't him to, I, by the way, I told <laughs> him to invite you. He said he won't fancy you. Yeah. <laughs> Three weeks I was there. Yeah. Just, just talk to us about the film and why you've chosen to do it now. 
You know what, I had a plan when I retired to do a documentary um, about my life at some point. Um, and even back then I was thinking, okay, the perfect time to do it would be like 10 years after I retired. So that was kind of the plan when I retired. Um, and it all, all just came together. It felt the right moment to do it. At some point I knew that I was gonna do it or have to do it, um, but it had to feel right. Um, and and in all honesty, you know, to, to have something like this that my kids can look back on, that my parents can look back on, all my friends and teammates that I've, that I've had over the years, and everyone that is in there has meant something to me, you know, on a, on a different level. Are you in it, Roy? Right? I'm in it, yeah. <laughs> ten, <laughs> ten seconds, did I get ten seconds? <laughs> I, was happy to do it. I was happy to do it, I want to get that out there. Bex, yeah. what's it like, because um, like, I'm looking forward to seeing it myself, what's it like looking back on the... You now looking back at what happened, like with the '98, and how you got through that. Um, to be honest, there was a lot of emotions that went with, you know, the filming that I've done over the last two years. Yeah. I probably did about 45, 50 hours of filming, wow. um, which I didn't expect to do it. You know, because obviously, when I mean, we've all seen the, the Michael Jordan documentary, yes, and yeah. he does two interviews. And that was my idea of that's what I was going to do and that was going to all be used as, you know, all archive. Yes. But then it changed with Fisher Stevens, the director. All of a sudden, we did one interview and he was like, OK, this is different. We yeah. need to do it in this yeah. way. So, but like the, the range of emotions were, were quite unbelievable from obviously my career, but then my family, you know, the kids, my parents, you know, all of, all of that. It was kind of a lot of emotions and well, then, you know, going through it, there's so much happened in my career and not all good. You know, in 98, obviously it was a, it was a tough time for me, but to get through that, you know, it was even tougher. Um, but it, it didn't feel tough at the time because I had the right people around me. I had a manager that looked after me, a team that looked after me and, and, and teammates that every time I stepped out onto the pitch, yeah. I knew that they had my back no matter what. So it didn't matter what else was going on and being said about me outside of Manchester United. It didn't really matter because all I cared about was my teammates and the team. But when you talk about Manchester United, you've got a couple of players now, a situation maybe with Sancho right now, especially Harry Maguire the last couple of weeks where, where people are saying the attention, mm. the criticism, the stick's gone over the top, it's gone too far. I mean, nothing can sort of match what happened there in 98 wow. after that, that World yeah, Cup. You know, this, so worst. this was going on mm. when, when we were players. It's not something just new, is it? No, no, and I think, you know, a few of us went through it, you know, and it always seemed to be, you know, a United player at the time. You know, obviously I went through it, Phil went through it, you know, a couple of lads went through it That's over the years, but Wayne, yeah. I think, you know, it, it's, it's a different time now. And in all honesty, I'm happy where it is now because mm. people are able to actually pull people into line about saying certain things because people react different, people people can't take it sometimes and it's you know it's a different time so um it was tougher is football like your escape at that point because i look at like harry Maguire and everyone goes he should just be able to get on with it but you can feel the pressure in his performance the social but, media side of it yeah. though, so that really brings it home a lot yeah yeah but yeah. did you feel like just getting back out onto the pitch and playing was your escape well, Manchester United was my escape, mm -hmm. um, you know, because f at the end of the day, football was my job, but I'd have done it anyway. Even if I weren't being paid f to play football, I loved football. So it was an escape, but in all honesty, it was Man United that was my, my, my escape from it all. Because like I said, once I was at training, you know, you know, not talking about Keeney too much, you know, because I don't want to embarrass him, but, you know, when you've got someone like Keeney in the team, that sets the high standards, not just in at the weekend, but every single day. Every yeah. single day there was a standard set. And I always thought that I was, you know, professional, dedicated, but nothing compared to what Keeney was like. Every single day in training, he wanted to win. Well, every a good dressing though, back No, there was a good dressing was. I it always was. say that. There were some brilliant lads in our dressing It was, but you you know, we always talk about the gaffer, you know, setting the right example, but you know, everyone in our team set that example and I knew that once I you know got back from the World Cup I knew once I was into that season that I would be protected and you know it showed from literally day one of the first first game of the season I knew you know as much stick as I was getting I didn't care because I was protected by the team yeah 
just looking at that now, and obviously I, we, we, all, we lived it obviously with you, but did you see a psychologist or anybody at that time? Were you speaking to you weren't At that time, you couldn't, there wasn't a support system in place, was there, in terms of that sort of net? No, again, you know, and going back on the era that I grew up in, and we all grew up in, you know, and obviously coming from where I was from, I was from a working class family, you know, and if I turned around to my dad at the time and said, Dad, I don't feel great today, can I see a therapist? I want to need to talk about it. He'd be like, boy, just get on with it. You know, and that's, that's how I was brought up. So no, I didn't see anyone. Um, I felt that I had the right people around me to not see, to, to, to not see anyone. Um, but I, I also do think, you know, these days we talk about mm. people being able to talk mm -hmm. and it's a good thing. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I grew up in an era where you know, my dad would just say, go and get on with it, boy. Well, Cara just mentioned, what advice would you give to Harry Maguire, who's going through a similar time now where he's getting a lot of criticism every time he plays for England or even for United? Do you know what? Harry's just got to keep doing what he's doing. At the end of the day, he's got to focus on football, which he, which he does. He's a good lad. He's had a great career. Has the criticism gone too, too much? I think it has. Yeah. I think as well, what else is it? Being a defender, you know, every single game, you know what I mean? I As you two can vouch. You're living in fear. It wasn't every game. We were all right. You're living in fear. You're right. A defensive mindset is you're living in fear of living making a mistake. Yeah, of yeah. making a mistake because it, when you look at Harry, Harry Maguire and some of the stuff, I don't want to take too far down there, but <sighs> any mistake he makes, it turns into a massive meal. I can't even imagine what that would have been like in 98 if, when Bex came back from the World Cup, if we had social media, yeah. if, if he's still sitting here. Yeah. Mm. Well, let's have a look at, um, we've got a Pulse 98 clip. Let's have a look at this. Still getting booed everywhere he goes, David Beckham. Personally, I think the continuing vendetta against Beckham is quite ridiculous. And oh dear! Tim Sherwood. <laughs> Any time that I got kicked during that season, it was like the team had scored two goals. Beckham! Jesus! Is that Sinton? Lucky for Bex, he's got players in his team that can flatten people. Ew. Nice one, Keenan. Go on, Keno. You go after him, you're going after all of us. It's inhumane what he had to put up with. Inhumane. It would have broke everybody. It would have broke probably 99.9% .9 of footballers. It's maybe Beckham come through this. How do you function? I don't know. I honestly, I actually don't know. Wow. It gives me goosebumps, yeah. I mean, that just takes you back to that moment. And mm. was that the lowest point in your football career? The free kick. <laughs> 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 we were sitting there expecting you to fly in. You got. <laughs> um, it was a low point, but you know, I think we all go through those yeah. those moments. And you know, that was my turn after the World Cup. And but I always talk about that. You know, I did make a mistake, um, and I was obviously punished for it. But at the end of the day, I think we all we all make mistakes. And um, you know, I was I was thankful though that I had the right people around me to get over it. You say about. Um, low points, we've all been through low points. I don't think there's many of us, you've seen what Harry Maguire's going through, I don't think many of us have been as low as that, uh, where you went. Because even, I remember even in our dressing room, we, we were talking about how bad it was. Remember the effigies at West Ham and all this stuff, but, you know, I don't think that a lot has been to the depths that you've been through. Mm. This is why I suppose... Well, I suppose it, it, it was more than just about the football in the end. I think that was, that was the tough part. You know, I had, I had people uh, doorstepping my, my grandparents' yeah. house um, and then obviously, you know, I, I would go out for dinner in London and people would spit at me wow. or, you know, punch the windows when they saw it was me at the light in, when I was in London and that's obviously where I'm from. Mm. So, you know, it was, it was tough, but, you know, thankfully, like I said, I had, I had good people around me. Well, let, let's look at another clip, and this is talking about when you f first came to Manchester. I like nice stuff. Oh, what's he like? Yeah. <laughs> as soon as we got money, it was like, I want to buy a nice watch. I love shopping, I love cars, I love watches. Let's have a look at your watch. What is it? It's a Rolex. This is interesting. Yeah, that's Gucci. I suppose you got to look good for the paparazzi. I thought you said you like nice stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Some dodgy wow. stuff in there. Too. Looks like Ted's jacket. I signed a contract with Adidas 
for 50,000 pounds. And I went and bought an M3 for 50,000 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> what is the obsession with the cars, man? Bentley's Porsche, yeah. He was the first to kind of turn that he upped everyone's game in the car park. I didn't know. <laughs> Not yours, that was your prelude. <laughs> <laughs> David used to get his salary on a Friday, he used to spend it on a Saturday all, and then spend the next five days waiting for his next salary to get the jeans to match. That was him. Have money, spend it. Have money, spend it. Have money, spend it. Where me and Gary were like, let's save it for a rainy day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he's still like that. Yeah, he's still like that. <laughs> I said, a pension. We used to put money into a pension, and David said, like, what the fuck are you doing? He came in, he was like, I've just bought a fancy pen. And we're like, who the fuck buys a pen? You know what I mean? Who buys a, a, an expensive pen? Shirts and clothes, I get all that in cars. But who buys a pen? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you were coming through now, obviously, I mean, your football was a high standard, but you, but you would be attacked for the flashness. And you were back then, weren't you, in yeah. terms of, you know, in the, even in the dressing room, we'd be like, this kid's a bit flash like compared to us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be fair, all of you, said it to me, you always used to call me the Flash Cockney. Uh, and, and that was always something that you always said, um, because you always said that I was more of a United fan than any of you. I used to wear the track suits, I used to have the nice boots. Um, but, yeah, I, 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 I grew up really, you know, like I said, I like nice things. <laughs> I do like nice things. Uh, and, and I suppose, again, that era, people weren't, you know, I driving Bentleys into training, and when I bought the Bentley, that was the first time I saw the gaffer looking out the window, and I was like, uh, so I parked it around the corner. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Well, you, he's going, you're, you're having a go with him for being flash. I mean, would you rather have a go for being flash? You know, sponsorship deals, <laughs> or have a go for looking like. <laughs> Jesus! Pony! <laughs> In more ways than one. <laughs> yeah, but I, 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 I'd rather be the Flash yeah. Cockney, would you? <laughs> yeah, but I like the gear. I remember when, when, when you came to England. For that, no. <laughs> when you came to England and that, I remember we used to talk about like the Maharishi gear and talk about. I used yeah. to. I like that all that sort of stuff. I remember the, the, mm. was it the purple. Piece? You could always dress though, right? Well, to be honest, you I don't always. Want to say. You know. I'll, I'll probably quote you on that one day. But, but <laughs> the thing is, is that like, I I don't know if it's a, it's not a London thing as well, but. Maybe seeing that picture of you. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it was a London thing. You but I think it was. Yeah, it's the gear. I was exactly the same. You're the same. You just like you like nice things like that. I bet he's you got a mean? nice pen. Yeah, you brought an expensive pen, pen? into you, know yeah, you know the one where you know the one where you press it's red, uh, yeah. green, <laughs> blue. It's just interesting because I always thought, to be fair, you were always massively respectful of Bex, or even when he left. But actually, it's the type of player that you ordinarily might be a little bit hard on because of the Rolexes, the Bentley, the cars and stuff like that. Only if a player didn't back it up now. Yeah, exactly. I, I, again, I'll be sitting there, listen, I'm not a dinosaur. We all walk with players who had a different taste and would spend their money. But I, I, it never bothered me as long as they backed it up. My worry would always any players, if they were doing that and they were spending their money, and again, good luck to them. But if they didn't want coming in training properly and that became the priority, that was always my worry. But I, I never found it with Bex, so that's why... We never fell My out. problem with Bex is that I was always worried that Bex is spending so much, you've got to worry about when you finish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Fair pension. Right. <laughs> 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 long song. Yeah. To be fair, all him and his kid went on about was a pension. You know, Paul Brooks. Remember Paul Brooks? Yeah. Paul Brooks used to come up and say, <laughs> OK. Paul yeah. Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> and I turned around to Victoria the other day. I was like, I, said, I wonder if my pension's still there. Mm. I don't know whether I'm still, like, earning from it. It's or tax free as well, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's all they went on about. That's all they went on about. Just talk to us a little bit about how the manager was with you around these types of things. We're going to show a couple of clips in a minute around your haircuts and clothes and stuff like that, where it started to get a little bit tense towards the end. But you were poking him, weren't you, a little bit? Did you know you were poking him? No. You, you didn't? No, not at all. I was just kind of... Just being out of here, yeah. me A little no, bit. Yeah, no. <laughs> you were tweaking the tail of the tiger, weren't you? <laughs> no, I didn't because I, I was just doing it because I wanted to do it. You know, I, 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 did, I, I suppose I knew that it was something that the manager wouldn't agree with. But like Keeney said, as long as I'm turning up for training on time, training yeah. and, and playing at the weekend to the standards, then it wouldn't be a problem. But I think you know, that's what changed over the years, you know, and then, you know, obviously Cristiano came to the club, was, you know, 
doing what he was doing, you know, on the pitch and off the pitch. And the, the gaffer had kind of softened at that point mm. to a certain, you know, to a certain level. But when I, obviously, when I was doing it, it was a different time and... and but Is it because you'd come through as a kid? Yeah, you'd come through from 14, hadn't you, basically? Maybe, yeah, maybe. But obviously, there were certain moments where the gaffer had tell me to do something. And I'm quite stubborn. So, you know, to even with my dad sometimes or my mum, when they would tell me to do things, I'd, I, I wouldn't question it, but I'd be a bit hesitant. And I was the same with the manager. So I suppose at that point when the manager was telling me to do things and I weren't doing them, you know, I suppose it all goes back to when he first asked me to, you know, when we talked about getting an agent and he told me to go with someone. Uh -huh, he wanted yeah. me to go with someone yeah. and I didn't. I went with someone else that he right. didn't agree with. Right. So then obviously that was a tough moment for us. <clears> but it's yeah. things like that, I suppose, that upset the manager. That's yeah. called power and control, David. <laughs> but I look back now, I mean, at the time I thought you were mad at times because obviously I was living this with you. I had more meetings with the manager about you than I did about myself. <laughs> because he would sometimes say, you know, try and get into you around things like age and around what you were wearing, traveling to London. Mm -hmm. When I look back now, if you hadn't have done those things, you wouldn't have been where you were today, would you? In terms um, of sort of like, you know, you think about the global nature of you and what you always want to achieve. I suppose there were some things that obviously um, got highlighted because obviously once me and Victoria were together, everything that we did mm -hmm. were more highlighted than any, probably anything that the manager had seen. So obviously, I, I suppose, all he was worried about was, you know, the football side. Um, nothing kept. Well, I'm, so, I'm sure he was worried about me as a as a as a person as well, because obviously I'd grown up at the club, and he, I think he cared about us as as players. Um, but I suppose it was, you know, at the end of the day, I was, I wasn't travelling to London as much as the manager thought. But obviously, More. because it, <laughs> <laughs> he thought it was three, it was four. <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair, like there's there, there, there's one moment I talk about in the documentary that when I was I was in Manchester and my phone rang and I picked it up and it was the gaffer and he went Beckham where are you David where are you and I said boss I'm in Manchester just driving past the Trafford Centre he said no you're not he said you're in Barcelona Airport my mate sat opposite you and I was like boss I'm literally I'm driving past it he said no you're not. And then put the phone down. Oh my wow. God. So it was things like that that happened. But at that point, I think. I would have drove straight. should have by the ringtone. When he was your yeah. phone's ringing, yeah. you should have gone to I would have drove straight to his house. Yeah. Because then he's, he's, so that means in his mind, he said, right, he's, he's, it's like he's not listening. I'm not in Barcelona, I'm here. I would have drove straight to his house, knocked yeah. the door. But, the, but, the, but then, you know, I suppose at that point, I remember Victoria being on tour with the Spice Girls and they were in um, Dublin for about four or five weeks. So I, without obviously telling anyone, I flew over to see Victoria one night because we had a day off the next day. Ryanair. Ryanair. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I was on Ryanair. So I'm sat in, uh, I'm on the way back to Manchester. It's like 5.30 in the morning. I'm sat in the lounge just waiting to board. And the gaffer walks in. Oh, on the same flight. That's unlucky, isn't it? it was yeah. Was it was he had the concert as well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but how's your luck, man? What a great night. <laughs> Did he so, tell you that you couldn't drive um, two or three days before a game? Because I remember reading that, and I was playing like I wasn't playing. I wasn't even semi-professional at the time, so I was like, I can't drive up the motorway three days before <laughs> a game. And I was like, well, I don't know how else I'm getting there because obviously you might have got a driver or something like that. But did he tell you about your driving? No, not at all. Did he not? Not at all. No, it was it was all all about travelling down up and down to London because at that point we, me and Victoria had just bought a house in London in yeah. Hertfordshire, so he thought that we were living there and driving up. Right. And he couldn't understand why I wanted a house in London <laughs> because obviously my life was in Manchester. But obviously, you know, me and Victoria from London at some point, you know, we were going to spend time there. So, yeah. you know, that's how it happened. But well, let's have a look at the, uh, this is just a clip, the shaved head. Sir Alex asks him to take his hat off. No. And he said, David, take the cap off. And I said, no. The stubbornness. And I uh, said, oh, well. And there's a new look about David Beckham. The blonde locks have gone. Yeah. The sight of the skinhead will take a bit of getting used to. <sighs> Come on. You're asking for a bollocking. You're asking for trouble. 
he knew that would piss Sir Alex off. Why? <laughs> so why do it? That was his personality. Never bothered you? Never bothered me in the least. I used to think you better fucking back it up at the weekend. David Beckham. He was always going to go for it. Yes, bro. Keeper. But the same old free kicks. He's got it. Did you affect your relationship with Sir Alex Ferguson? No, not at all. Are you afraid of him? At times. <laughs> Just talk us through that a little bit, because there was one at Leicester, but then there was the, the Mohawk, wasn't mm. there? Yeah, I mean, the Leicester one, I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. I think it wasn't the haircut that probably upset him. It was probably the fact that I, I really didn't... No one saw it until I actually came out to the pitch with the team at, before the start of the game. Even the warm-up, I wore a beanie. <laughs> and I don't know why, I just wore a beanie up until that point where I step on the pitch and, you know, I'm, I'm ready for the game. The mohawk was slightly different what? because I'd, I'd been doing... <laughs> <laughs> I had a photo shoot during that week and obviously for the yeah. photo shoot I shaved my hair myself and then I did the mohawk and then obviously I think we were playing either in the charity, charity shield, shield, or, charity shield yeah. and, the, and the gaffer, literally I took the hat off and he went... You, and he looked at me and went, go and shave it off. <laughs> and we were just about to go out for the warm-up. So I had to then get a pair of clippers, go into the, the changing room in, uh, wow. at Wembley and shave it off. <laughs> I, can under I could understand that. Um, re well, actually, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you went and shaved it off. <laughs> I went and shaved it off, because he wouldn't have played me. But there were those tensions, little tensions building through that time, because just big characters. Yeah. Would you say, I mean, you were sort of, you weren't giving up where you obviously met Victoria, the, the, the the two of you were huge. I mean, the Spice Girls were a phenomenon at that time, and Manchester United were a phenomenon just about to win the treble. And it was coming together. And it just, do you think it just got too big for him in the end, the actual sort of noise around it all? I don't know. I don't know. What do you think, Ian? <laughs> Power and control. What, from him? No, the manager, that's how we managed. Never, you were getting older, we were all getting older, you were getting married and obviously having kids. And the manager certainly didn't like that. Not having that control over mm. players, whether it be the agency, your haircut, where you were living. And no doubt he was getting fed up with it, not just with you, Bex, with other players. Because mm. he was losing that control with players. You talk about that control, but do you think he had that control over, over yourself, you, all the lads that come through? Because you're young players, you always feel like you, you're all the club or you're all the manager. Mm. But then you're getting old, you're getting more mature. And as Roy said, you've got your own family and you've got your own I, sort I, of ideas. But, but I always felt that I was making the right decisions. Mm. You know, I, I don't think that I ever made a decision that was harming the club or was harming my performance or harming my teammates. You know, yes, I was married to a Spice Girl and at that point it was like huge and, yeah. you know, it was a massive thing. And obviously the, the two of us coming together created, I think, an attention that, you know, the, the manager couldn't, I, I don't know whether it was that he didn't understand, he just didn't want that attention around the club. And I think that he, you know, over the years, the manager had always made the right decision in his eyes for the team and for the club, you know, for, for, for no other reason other than that. And I felt that that obviously was, was, you know, it happened to me in the end. You know, I didn't want to leave Manchester United at the time. Um, you know, we just won the league again. But, you know, all of a sudden I get a phone call to, to be told that United have agreed a deal and, and that was the end of it. And, you know, even trying to speak to the manager after that, he didn't want to talk to me. You know, it was purely, it wasn't that he, it was out of spite, it was purely, he was on holiday, he didn't want to be contacted, he'd made his decision and, and, that, and that was the end of it. Uh, but I think, you know, it happened notoriously over the years at Manchester United with, you know, Mark Hughes and Konchelskis and all of these, you know, Ince, you know, all of these great players, you know, getting let go at a time where we felt they were in their prime, but all of a sudden, <coughs> manager makes the decision and that's all that matters. So. You know, that was that was really... But I never felt that I was doing anything that would harm the club. You know, I still love the club like I did when I was five years old. You and know, it was I'd never always... an issue in the dressing room, was it? You were talking about no. your lifestyle and who you were married to, but it never was an issue in the dressing room, was it? We never felt... Could you imagine if you weren't negative winning? negative energy about it. Could you imagine Look, if you weren't listen, winning? That does help, right? Of course, when you're winning, yeah, but it was never an issue in the dressing room. No. With... He's, he's, yeah, but he's, he seems really spicy in, in respects of, like you say, the training... Always turn up in training, always done the stuff. The same thing I saw when you was with England. I can't understand why he couldn't let it go. 
so Alex? He, he wouldn't let things go. I mean, that, he wouldn't let things sort of brew. Would, can, you, can you ever see, a, when you look back now, do you ever think of a life where you stay at Manchester United for the whole of your career? Because I know that's what your mum and dad wanted, wasn't it? You know, they were absolutely yeah, massive it's, reds. Yeah, it's what I wanted. You know, yeah. I, at, at, when I was growing up, I was a United fan, so all I ever wanted to do was play my whole career at United, start there and finish there. But in all honesty, I now look back at it and I think that decision that the manager made actually was the best one for Manchester United and it was the best decision for me. You know, because I then went on to play for unbelievable clubs with unbelievable players. I don't think it was the best for United. Things. Things. I don't know if it was the best for Man United. I think it ends up being brilliant for you and living in a new country and trying something else. But I certainly don't think it was good for the dressing room. And, and I could say the same when NC left and these lads. When players go, you do think there was no real logical reason for a player to leave at that time. Rob, you, you, were t you were in conversation, with, it was reported, with Bayern Munich and you were about to leave. How close were you to leave? Yeah, very close, yeah. I wish I bloody had. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that Do you wish been... you had, though? Uh, I wish I'd gone abroad, yeah. What about Juventus? So yeah, I would agree to deal. Yeah, my contract was up, obviously, a couple of times when I'd done my cruise shit and I came back. And I had opportunities to, to go, obviously, on a free. Mm. And, yeah, a part of me is jealous when I see other lads now going abroad because it's a great experience for your family, and maybe. But, again, I was really happy at United and contented. If I knew it was going to end it, I'd look back now, loyalty and all that type of talk with Ferguson. I probably definitely should have gone abroad and experienced a, a different league. That's all I is. Well, I mean, I look back now at your life and you think that you were in Milan, Paris, Madrid, it would, LA. My it would, life that would have be happened. totally different. Yeah. It would be totally different because I'd have still been living in Manchester. You know, my life would have been completely different. Whereas... You've just been cashing in your pension. <laughs> 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 but, it's true. It, but it's true, you know, I had the opportunity then to play in Spain, learn a new language, a new culture, and then from there, obviously, move to America. And then, obviously, when I move to America, then I have the opportunity to buy a team. Mm -hmm. So, and then I go to Milan, then I end my career in, in Paris. Um, so all of those things, and culturally, you know, it's something that I loved. You know, I love that I experienced playing abroad, you know. And like I said, when I, gr when I, when I was growing up, I had no intention of leaving Man United, but when it happened, <clears throat> it's probably the best thing that could have happened for my life. When I look back now, I, I think there was Even though I didn't want it. Yeah, there, I think there was another reason, and obviously Carlos had come to the club, and I think he wasn't having me and you together down that side. We mm. played together... Obviously. He was the first person to come in and not be happy with, me and obviously, you, yeah. me and you. We played for seven or eight years together, hadn't Apart we? Apart from Keane. <laughs> 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 more of these sweets <laughs> <laughs> but what I mean is down that right side it was like a partnership and we played together and I just felt at that point he would either want me in or you in mm. Ollie would come in in Quite front quite surprising he got rid of me and not you he's <laughs> <laughs> got less wages though, don't you? <laughs> so let's have a look at this where is it there we go Gary Neville Beckham we were absolutely destroying teams down that right hand side he was with his crossing and I was supporting him in a way which to be fair was I said it was a side dish, really. <laughs> <laughs> it's another full of collection for David Beckham. Not the beef. I was the mustard on the side. <laughs> Gary was Mr. Sensible. I was the mustard to your beef. Oh, Gaz, Gaz always talked. He could always talk, and we very rarely listened to him. <laughs> <laughs> but there was just that special connection between us. First of all, do you think he's a good player? Yeah, I think he's going to be the best midfielder in um, England. I'm sure of that he's unique in that he can do things that other footballers can't do. Gary Neville. I was subservient. Beckham. Because I need David to go and do something magical. Glorious ball. He was practising free kicks, I was practising throw-ins. <laughs> <laughs> Beckham. It's a difficult ball, but how about that for execution? We were like that on the pitch. It was telepathic off the pitch as well, I knew where he was in his mind. It wasn't enough for him. He wanted to be more than a football player. Now, I've got to know this fella really well <laughs> over the last we go. 10 years. <laughs> Sabotaging <laughs> my own show. <laughs> but no one, you told, you're like that? Mm. Best man at your wedding, so nobody can know this man okay. better than David Beckham. So we're gonna go back to a magazine here. In 1996. So I'm going to ask you the questions <laughs> mm. and you tell me what you think his answers would be. If the world was to end tomorrow, what would you do with your last day? What did Gary Neville say? 
Check his pension. <laughs> uh, oh. You've got to remember 1996, yeah. you in there. Yeah. Um, what would it be? I suppose play at Old Trafford. I would uh, sleep all day and just relax. I love relaxing. <laughs> I guess I'm lazy. Who's that? This is the busiest <laughs> man <laughs> in football. Did I say that? Yes, you said that. Ah. Me some person. Wow. Oh, yeah, this is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Who gets the most attention from Gales? You or Phil? <laughs> There we go. I used one. to get Bex's knockdown. Yeah, I'll tell What's you what his answer. answer. What? I don't know really. We probably get the same amount as each other. <laughs> I don't really like it much. Apart from anything else, I've got a girlfriend. Oh. <laughs> I like supporters of football, whatever sex they are, but it's not so great when you're on a night out and girls just sit next to you and, and stuff. But to be honest, it doesn't happen to me so often. <laughs> <laughs> what is this, by the way? Oh, this is on a biography. We're getting there. <laughs> oh, yeah, what have we got it's here? It's United magazine. It's got to be United. What is this? What magazine is well, it? Well, you ruined That we did the players' yeah. pool. Yeah. Use a room. For a bit. Yeah. What annoys you most about your roommate? About him? No, what? So he, he's being asked that, and oh, he's so you're his roommate. It's got to be how tidy I am. And how much I got him on the phone to Victoria. Yes, he's always on the phone. He stays up late as well, which I don't like. <laughs> That's nine o'clock, by the way. I used to have I, to go and lie in the bath. And yeah. What? Who would be your ideal date? What do you think he said? Who did he fancy in the room? Uh... Besides you. <laughs> <laughs> Who did Gary fancy? <laughs> I don't want to say the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> is it Baby Spice? I'm trying to think myself. <laughs> is it like Baby Spice? It is now! <laughs> I feel like it's like a Debbie from work. <laughs> Put your K out to her. <laughs> <laughs> Who was it? Who was it, Joey? <laughs> like, he's getting this in. He's, he's, you know, he's putting her in. Like I say, I've got a girlfriend. <laughs> but, <What>? but. <laughs> Princess Diana. Oh, oh see? Yeah. Yeah. Classy, classy bloke. The girl out of Braveheart. Oh, yeah, his yeah, wife that got killed. Yeah, yeah his oh, wife that got killed. Yeah, good, yeah. Good 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 and Olivia Newton-John. Yeah, mm. I mean, seriously. Yeah. Quite a high level. I've got a girlfriend, but he is free. He's <laughs> free. <laughs> like, so then the next question is, <clears throat> so you're not a Pamela Anderson fan, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. And you said, <laughs> no, these models look all right, but they do me head in. What model? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, he could look at someone on telly like Victoria and go and actually marry her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, we actually were rooming together in Georgia when you first watched that video of Victoria with, with the, uh, yeah. the cats. I've got uh, Seal yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Black cat. <clears throat> was that it? He was watching the one of yeah. Emma Bunton. Hey, <laughs> you? What? You, Emma Bunton. <laughs> 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 I said I like Baby Spice, but it's never quite worked out. <laughs> I thought he might. She must have met you. <laughs> she must have met me. <laughs> that ruined that old straight away. Yeah. <laughs> right, your dad's here today. Ted, come on. In you come. Ted, in you come. Come and stand round here. Oh, Teddy, Teddy. I'm going to say sorry for anything <laughs> he says. <laughs> we have to get legals out. Don't swear in. I'll try not to. Ted, you watched him every single step of the way, and you must be so proud, obviously, now the film's coming out this week. It must be good to reflect upon everything that's happened. Yeah, it's been, it's been an absolutely wonderful career for him. And uh, as a dad, I mean, there aren't many dads that um, wish their son like, you know, had a son like him. I mean, he's been brilliant. And uh, his career's been correct. Mm. Where, does he get the this, where does he get the stubbornness from, yeah. Ted? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously from me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now he's, uh, he's a good lad. Mm. <laughs> Just talk to us about, obviously, family. And, you know, you've obviously travelled all around the world, but you're probably more settled now than you've ever been in terms of, obviously, finishing your career. Mm. Yeah, I've always said, and it's like everyone, you know, my family's the most important thing to me. You know, as, as much as I love football, as much as I've had, obviously, the career that I've had and played for the teams that I've played for, my number one thing is always my family. And my every decision that I make is, is for them. Uh, you know, even doing the documentary, you know, I want them to have something. You know, I want my mum and dad to have something that they can look back on. And, and it's all in one place. It's, you know, it's... Um, family's the most important thing to me. Um, but, like, like my dad, you know, my dad talks about... My mum and dad never missed a game. 
you know, no matter where I was playing, apart from obviously LA, it was a little bit too far from East London for them to travel every every weekend. But other than that, they were at every game, every youth team game, every reserve team game, like your mum and dad were, you know, and, and the community that we had, you know, at that time, you know, in you know, in the youth team. Mm. It wasn't just us that were friends and teammates, it was our parents as well that all hung out, they all went on holiday together, they all travelled together. And it was a special thing. But the family part for me is 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 the most important thing. What, what, what's your thoughts, Ted, in terms of obviously now your <clears throat> football career's finished? I will say, you know, everybody goes on about Cantona, but this man here... You, oh, you, you're too kind. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> he means his lads. <laughs> <laughs> but the team wouldn't have won so much if it hadn't been for him, because I've watched... I've got probably 1,300 videos of David's games and whatever, and England games. Um, but especially Man U, and this, this man here, he, he worked his socks off for the team. Mm. And it proved, you know, when, when he got booked against <clears throat> Juventus, you know, he still played like he, you know, was going to play in the final. But it's been incredible. Um, football, to me, has been my life. And uh, I've been there for him mm. and, you know, vice versa. Um, but... Uh, it's a beautiful thing, man. Yeah, yeah it is. I mean, you, you support your kids, mm -hmm. um, and that's what me and his mum have done. Well, it's a beautiful place to finish, and all the best to you. Thank you, uh, With the film, and thank you very much for coming on. Nice Thanks. one, Bex. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.